morning. <clears throat> hey, before I preach, I want to just share a couple of things that are, that are on my heart. Uh, one from the past, one for the future. Um, <clears throat> we'll do the future one first. So coming up in November is these, uh, all these votes. And I want to speak specifically, I want to share my heart this morning specifically about uh, the issue number one. And for some of you, you might be like, whoa, what's going on here? I've, Jim, Pastor Jim has never spoken about politics from the pulpit before. Well, I don't have a pulpit, so no, just, just kidding. I'm, you're right. I, I have made it a practice to not speak about politics, especially partisan politics. I don't believe it's the role of the church to uh, try to campaign for a vote for a candidate or uh, some, some party. And so um, I've talked before about Jesus' view of politics, but it's just never spoken about you know, an issue or a candidate or a vote. Um, but I, I've just felt this growing burden that I need to share about this, this, this time because for me, the issue one, number one is, or issue number one is all about the abortion issue. Uh, I know there's other people, things trying to cloud that and other people trying to make it other things, but to me, it's clearly about abortion. And I have spoken. Uh, over the years, very clearly, very strongly uh, against abortion. Um, <clears throat> but abortion has become politicized. It's become a political issue. And here's why I'm speaking about this in a political um, season, <clears throat> is because before it was a political issue, it was an, a biblical issue and a moral issue. And I grieve that it has become politicized. But just because it has become politicized, and it has. I mean, abortion is a political issue now. Just because it has become politicized doesn't negate the fact that it was always, and it is first and foremost, a biblical and moral issue. And that's why I've spoken out about it in the past. Um, and I feel I strongly I need to speak out. I'm, I'm hearing some people confused about, well, you know, does the Bible have anything to say about this? You know, what, what should our position be? And the Bible absolutely talks about the fact that every human being is made in the image of God. And it is not our right. It is no one's right to take a life that God has given. No, no mother, no state, no government, no a decision. We, it is, we are not God. And we are not to take what God has given. That's as clear as a bell. And I've spoken about that. And the fact that we're now going to vote about that, and, uh, and some people are trying to make it about other issues, I just feel like I need to say something very clear about what the Bible says about this. Because see, guys, as Christians, we're being bombarded all the time from other world views. They don't project themselves as, here's this worldview, listen to it, but that we're hearing all the time other worldviews, and if we're not discerning, and if we're not people of the word, we won't know the difference, and we'll just kind of vote our conscience, or vote whoever is most persuasive, or vote about my feelings about this or that, and we will not live as light in the world, living with a biblical worldview, and this issue is crystal clear, a biblical worldview calls for us to protect life. And so I will be voting no on issue number one. And I urge you, no, you don't need to clap. I, I urge you to, to think as a Christian. It's, it's not just one issue, but that is the biggest issue in, in, my, in my mind. Which now leads me to the, the second thing. And that is that I, I'm so sorry that I never said anything last week about the the war in Israel. I didn't know about it last Sunday morning. I know it happened Saturday, but I was apart from my social media. Not that I'm actually living in social media. Those who know me know I don't. But I mean, I wasn't into my news feeds. I was removed from all that. So I didn't actually find out about the invasion until um, Sunday afternoon. And like you, I'm guessing you were horrified at the news that came out of Israel, the atrocities, just mind-boggling evil and atrocities that, that are still ongoing. And so I just want, I want to call us as a church to pray. I want to start my message this morning praying for this issue, number one, and praying for 
not only the, the people of Israel, but the, the innocents on the, on the other side as well. There's too many innocent lives that are being taken, that are being massacred. There's, there's, there's just so much bloodshed. And, and what I want us to pray is that that Jew who lived on this earth 2,000 years ago, we, you do remember Jesus of Nazareth was a Jew, is a Jew, that that Jew his life, his teaching, his death, his resurrection would be revealed to Israel and to Hamas and other Palestinians and that they would see who Jesus, now I'm preaching, (laughs) who Jesus is and they would bow their knees before him. Amen? So would you join with me? Lord God, we pray for the, the innocent today, those in wombs, and those in the line of fire, lives who are being taken over, all over this place, all over this world. And God, we, we stand against that kind of evil. We stand against the, that kind of mindset that treats children in the womb as if it's just tissue. And oh God, for, forgive our country for our our constant murder of little ones for convenience. God, forgive us for our failure to speak up for the little ones. God, we pray for, the, for, for mothers who have been conned and pressured into getting abortions or been misinformed and who are now carrying around wounds from an abortion. They had God give grace and mercy. And then, Lord, for, for those that are caught in this the crossfire and these, this, these, this invasion into Israel and, and the lives that are being taken, Israeli lives, Palestinian lives, oh, God, would you bring an end to this war? God, would you elevate and lift up the name of Jesus? And then would, would there be a revelation of who Jesus is, just like it, it says it will happen in the end days, and the people will bow their knees. You will be revealed, Lord Jesus, for who you are. For there is no other hope. There is no peace concords. There is no uh, conversations. There's only one, the Prince of Peace, who can set us free. Lord Jesus, we pray that many people would be drawn to you. And in that spirit of people being drawn to you, help me now preach about this very thing, people coming to you, Lord Jesus, and us telling others about you. For we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, or most of us, and everybody said, okay, that's better, that's better. All right, so as you heard me pray, say my prayer, I want to talk about um, this whole idea of people coming to Jesus. So if if you're here, we've been working our way through what we're calling an excursion, and it's all about taking your next step in this process of becoming more and more like Jesus. How Ephesians 4 talks about how we're to grow in every way. And every week I talk about how we've stretched out that word Christ into an acronym. And we've worked our way through these first three the last couple of weeks. And today we come to this idea of eventual, uh, intentional evangelism. We want to grow in this way. Grow in every way to become more and more like Christ. But today... Grow in this idea of intentional evangelism. What is that? Well, since these are all Christ-like characteristics, meaning we saw and see Jesus doing these things in the Scripture, so when we want to become like Christ, these are the six core, six core Christ-like characteristics, and we see Jesus intentionally, not haphazardly. He's not a wandering Jew. He's intentionally Good newsing people. That's what the word evangelism means. It's, it's, to, it's to good news people. It's to bring the good news. And Jesus is going out of his way to tell people who God is, to tell people what God is like, to tell people about the kingdom of this God, to help people hear the good news. So you could almost say that, that evangelism, in a real, a real simplistic way, is telling others about Jesus, what he came to say, what he came to teach, what he came to preach, how he came to live, how he died on the cross. It's, evangelism is telling the good news about Jesus, telling others about that. So 
I've entitled this sermon Growing, because that's the whole point of what's your next step, is that we're growing to become more and more like Jesus. So in this fourth core Christ-like characteristic, how do we grow in intentional evangelism? How do we grow in telling others about Jesus? And again, I want to repeat that we typically grow through these stages. We, we come to Christ, so therefore we're beginning in Christ. We begin to grow in Christ and, and become like, a, like, a, like a, a toddler, grows from a baby to a toddler. Then hopefully we mature and continue to mature in Christ and ultimately get to the point where we are reproducing. That's the adult. That's the one who's becoming more and more, so much like Christ that you're leading people to Christ. You're discipling people. You're not just maturing, but you are mature. And that maturity is seen in your reproduction, in your leading others to Christ, helping others to become more like Christ. So we want to grow in this particular one here, this, this intentional evangelism. So let's start in that first stage. A person who's beginning in Christ, a person who's just come to Christ, who's brand new in the faith, how do they grow in evangelism? How do they grow in telling others about Jesus? And I got, I got thinking about this, thinking about the people that I've led to Christ, thinking about the people that I've seen grow in the Christ in those early days. And I thought to myself, hey, what's going on here is that these people are actually experiencing the good news. They're experiencing evangelism. Again, evangelism is telling others about Jesus. So this beginning person in Christ, this brand new Christian, is living in the glow, living in the the joy of just experiencing the good news, celebrating their salvation, that, that, that their life has been transformed from darkness into light. And as we said last week, it feels, emphasis on the word feels, it feels so good to have your sins forgiven. It feels so good to have your guilt washed away. It feels so good to see God working in your life and all the things that happen. And, and I found myself remembering how the last couple of people that I've led to Christ, I found myself some point in the, in the sharing going to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It's a verse I memorized in the King James a long time ago, but I've come to like the New Century Version translation of this the best. That if anyone belongs to Christ, they're, they're a Christian now, they're beginning in Christ, there is a new creation. That's a, that's a powerful phrase. A new creation. The old King James, behold, the old have things have gone. Everything is made new. And as I share this with the person that I'm witnessing to or the person that I've just led to Christ or a person who's young in Christ, I, I, I just find myself camping on, on several of these phrases because they're, they're all so amazing. You now belong to Jesus. You are not your own. You belong to Jesus. And you're a, a new creation. You've been born again. Sometimes the Bible t- talks about. And all these old things, the old sin, the guilt, the things that have passed away, that the, your past that you want to avoid, that's all gone. It's all ancient history. And now you have a whole new future ahead of you. I, I love the phrase, everything is made new. So you write that up in your notes, that this person who's experiencing the new birth, experiencing the Holy Spirit, working their heart to cause them to be born again. Do you, those of you who've been Christians for a while, do you remember this? Do you remember? Someone say yes. I, re, I remember years ago, or I remember last year, or I remember, you know, 50 years ago. I remember coming to Christ and experiencing, experiencing the good news, and everything seems new because everything is new, as the passage says, Everything is made new. And I got thinking about, you know, what those new things are. If everything is made new, what are they? Well, we can start with this new creation, which is a new life, and then just bam, new life, new identity, new start, new relationship, new family, new love, new freedom, new perspective, new power, new purpose, dot, dot, dot. It just just goes on and on. I thought to myself, I can preach a whole sermon. I can preach a whole series out of just that phrase, everything is made new. 
when you come to Christ. So, so what's happening in, in, in evangelism? You're experiencing that. It's, it's not something you're hearing other people talk about or some preacher, you know, spit and yell about, but it's now your story. And you're, you're sharing your story because evangelism is telling others about Jesus. And what you're doing is telling how you were made new, telling the, the moment that you found your life being transformed, telling people about how your life has been changed. And you see this um, over and over again in the New Testament when people meet Jesus and he, he changes their life and sometimes goes like this, like in Luke 8, 40, 8, 39, Jesus said, return home and tell how much God has done for you. That's actually an, an amazing verse. Go home, go home to your, 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 your spouse, your family, your, your relatives, and tell them the story, your story. So you don't have to, this, at this point, we're not talking about leading people to Christ. We're not talking about convincing people, persuading people. We're not talking about preaching. We're just talking about sharing your story. Tell them how much God has done for you. And that sharing your story picture there is exactly what the guy does. The verse ends with, so the man went away <laughs> and did what Jesus said and told all over the whole town how much Jesus had done for him. What he's doing when he's telling his story is he's spreading the good news. This is part of what evangelism is. You're telling your story and spreading the good news because your story has been impacted by Jesus. Your, your story is not just you know, something that happened. It's what Jesus has done in your life. And so if, if you want some help with this, in our excursion guide, and we've all got these, hopefully, on page 80 in our excursion guide, there's a, um, a page, a, a little exercise there that can help you create an outline that telling your story. And when I've talked about this in the past, this idea of telling your own story, I've talked about, and this is on page 80, you know, you talk about what your life was like before Christ, how you actually came to Christ and how it's now been different. And I can do this in 30 minutes. I can do it in three minutes. I can do it in 30 seconds. And I've actually encouraged you to write it down, maybe write down a 30-minute version or maybe a 10-minute version, and then narrow it down so you can tell your story in three minutes. And then when you can do that, narrow it down so you can tell your story like the elevator speech, you know, in, in, in a couple of seconds. You know, and so I, I like, for instance, in John chapter nine, when these guys were giving this guy grief about Jesus, this man was blind and Jesus healed him on a Sabbath. And so the religious leaders got upset and they're like, well, you know, tell us about this guy. And he's like, I don't know anything about him. All I know is that once I was blind and what? Anybody know? And now I can see what a powerful testimony. I was blind and now I can see. Wow, that's sharing your story. And understand, you, are, uh, you don't have to bring anybody to Christ here. It's just, this is so powerful, learning to tell your story. But since we wanna grow in evangelism, we wanna move beyond stage one just experiencing and telling our story, to stage two, young in Christ, beginning to learn the gospel. And you, say, you might say to yourself, well, if you've experienced the gospel, then you don't need to learn the gospel. Actually, you might be surprised how many people do not understand, let me put it this way, how many Christians do not understand what the gospel is. So let me put a, question up here on the, on, the, on the screen. What is the answer to this question? What is the gospel? What is the gospel? And you, 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 for some of you, it might be, well, duh, it's real easy. And then as you start to explain it, you, you, okay, well, I need to add this and add that and add this. And, you know, how exactly do I explain what the gospel is? And especially if you're familiar with the scriptures, you're like, well, Huh, there's a lot of different times that the word gospel is used. And actually, I, I want to do something I don't usually do. I want to go to the English. I always go to the Greek or Hebrew. I want to go to the English definition of this word gospel because it, 
our English word that we use the word that we use today, the word gospel, comes from an ancient old English, which is a combination of the word good and spell, don't think witches, think message. That's what that word means in old English, O L D E. <laughs> good plus spell, that's good, the good message, the good news. But in this ancient English, um, as it began to morph into modern day English, that became the gospel, which is good news. So there's where we came up with that word. And that's giving us a little bit of insight because as we said, evangelism is, is the word is telling the good news. It's sharing people with people, the good news, the gospel. But then we have these multiple um, places in the New Testament. Actually, you can even see this in the Old Testament, looking forward to it, where the word gospel is used in ways that cause some people to say, because they don't know their Bibles yet well enough, what well, sounds like there's multiple gospels. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. The very first time this word is used is in the gospel of Matthew. So if you wanna turn there, the very first time this word is used, it's in <clears throat> the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter four, verse 23. And it's describing how Jesus went through the region of Galilee. He's teaching in the Jewish synagogues. He's proclaiming, here, see this phrase, good news? That's the word, euangelion, evangelism. And if you have the ESV, it actually uses the word gospel. I don't know which translation you have. The NIV uses the word, the phrase good news. The ESV uses the word gospel. Same word, same thing, but there's, there's the first time this gets used in the New Testament. And notice this phrase here, it is the gospel of the kingdom. First time that word is used, Jesus is speaking about the gospel of the kingdom. So you put that down up here when we're asking the question, what is the gospel? Well, the answer is it's the gospel of the kingdom, right? Yes, but now let me throw up on the screen a bunch of other times that the word gospel gets used. <laughs> and it's, it's quote, these are all quotes from the New Testament. Um, it's the gospel about Jesus. It's the gospel of Jesus, not about Jesus, but of Jesus. It's the gospel of our Lord Jesus. It's the gospel of God. These are all quotes. The gospel of peace, the gospel of God's grace, the gospel of his son, the gospel of your salvation. <laughs> Which one is it? And so we started with this one. Let's go down to this last one here, the gospel of your salvation. A, a picture of that is seen in the, word, the mouth of no, none other than the apostle Paul, who says, by this gospel, your salvation, this is the gospel of your salvation, by this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach, otherwise you have believed in vain. So no other gospel will save you, but the one that I'm about to share with you, for what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, and here it is, this is the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that's the Old Testament, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then it continues to talk about he appeared to Cephas and then the 12 and then other people. This is the gospel that Paul is saying he proclaims and that it's, this is the one by which you are saved. And if you don't believe in this one, then you're, you believe in vain. And it's caused some people to go, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Is, does that mean that this gospel, the gospel of your salvation, is in conflict with the gospel of the kingdom? Because let me back up. The kingdom words do not appear anywhere in these verses. I thought, well, so which gospel is it? And some people have actually said there are two gospels. Others have said, well, there's actually multiple gospels. So let me be real clear. There's only one gospel. There's only one gospel, and it's described in many different ways. And so these statements are not in conflict with each other. They're describing the, the gospel but in different ways, in different contexts, in different situations. So I'm gonna give you, the, I think, the most simple definition of the gospel because it is about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. It is about the kingdom of God that Jesus came to announce and to bring. It is about how do we get along with the king of the kingdom. It, it is about how do I live. The gospel is about how do I live in the kingdom. The gospel is about 
Jesus, and it's the message he came to bring, that he is Lord of all, and this brings peace to us. This is the good news of God, and it involves Jesus' life and teaching and death and resurrection. And you don't see that in the phrase kingdom because when Jesus came announcing the gospel of the kingdom, he hadn't yet died, certainly hadn't been raised from the dead. And yet Paul is saying that's really important. And it is. If I'm just here to tell you some nice things Jesus said and I never get to the cross and I never get to the resurrection, then that is not something that's gonna save me. And it's good news to hear, but it's not saving good news. So I think the simplest way to talk about, I'm going to use the word good news here, is the gospel is the gospel. It is the good news about Jesus. That's the simplest way to describe it. And now you can go on from there and, and talk as much as you want about how that means this Jesus who came from heaven, who is God, left heaven and came to earth. That's Christmas. That's the beginning of the gospel. And, and lived, and he, went back, he was born of a virgin. So he's, he's fully man, but he's also fully God. He's a unique person. The gospel about Jesus is about this unique person. I don't want to just say absolutely unique, but that's a tautology, right? That's a redundant tautology. <laughs> For those of you who know those words, <clears throat> it's, that's, that's actually kind of funny, a redundant tautology, but whatever. Um, um, so you can talk as much as you want about that good news of Jesus, that when he came to be born, he was born of a virgin, he's sinless, perfect in every way, lived, taught, died a sacrificial death, a substitutionary death on the cross for your sins and mine was raised in the third day. And that, proclaiming that message about Jesus, how do I live in the kingdom? How do I follow Jesus? I, first, it starts with me surrendering my life and believing that he died on the cross for my sins and forgave me of my sins. And, and because he was resurrected, I will be resurrected. You see all the words I'm using? It's like, man, it's just, it just goes on and on and on. I know, I know, but even though it goes on and on and on, it comes back to this simple phrase. I know I have a friend who says, no, Jim, the gospel is not the good news about Jesus. The gospel is Jesus. That's about as simple as you can get. So, you know, okay. But this is, I'm getting this language about what good news is. So, so we, when we start with that, we're, now we're, we, let's get back to our, our outline. We're asking the question, I, I become a new person. I'm, everything is new. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. I want to grow in my understanding of the gospel, right? And so that's why I need to think through. I need to read the scriptures. I need to come to terms with what exactly is the gospel? Who is Jesus? Well, he's fully God and fully man. What did he come to do? To show us what the Father is like, to tell us who God is, to live a life of love. And what else did he do? He died on the cross for my sins. I, I'm expanding now. I'm getting, I'm understanding what the gospel is. And if I really understand the gospel, then with that understanding, and I, the if is a big word, because I'm convinced there's a lot of Christians who don't understand the gospel. And I don't just mean because people argue about what is the gospel, but because I don't think people grasp all that the gospel is. And if you do understand the gospel, then you will also understand that you have been given a commission to Tell that gospel. If you understand the gospel, you can't keep it to yourself. You, understanding it in, implies, not implies, in, mandates, that's the better word, mandates that you go and tell others. Well, in the words of Jesus, we need to be maturing to the point where we're telling that gospel because we understand what the commission is. Um, this word commission often gets used to describe Matthew's version of this word, which you probably know, go into all creation or go into all the world making disciples or as you're going, make disciples of all nations. This is Mark's version. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the, there's our word again, the gospel, the good news about Jesus, who he was, what he came to do, what that implies now. So we've been given this great commission to go tell the gospel. And here's how we know that you've moved from young in Christ to maturing in Christ is that you understand it, point two, so well 
let me make this clear, you understand the gospel so well that you start sharing the gospel. That's how we know that you've moved from young in Christ to maturing in Christ. And I just stepped on a whole bunch of people's toes. Some of you don't even realize it. That is, most Christians, when it comes to this fourth core Christ-like characteristic, intentional evangelism, most of who I'm talking to right now, those I can see here in Elyria, those I can't see in online and other campuses, most of you have not yet moved into the maturing stage. You're still stuck in the young in Christ stage. You say, well, that's impossible. I've been a Christian 50 years. I, I know, it's, it does seem impossible. But who have you shared Christ with? And if the answer is crickets, that's why you're not yet in maturing in Christ. So how do I get into this maturing as if that's the goal? It's not just to get into that, but it's to grow and mature. You start sharing the gospel. And I say that phrase, you start sharing the gospel, but it doesn't start. Sharing the gospel does not start with you just opening your mouth and sharing the gospel. In the Bible, sharing the gospel starts with John 3, 16. Who can say it? For God so, what's the word? Even if you don't know the Bible, you may know that verse. If you like baseball, you've seen John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. That there's the, there's the, the gospel begins with love. This is where you say, amen. Let me try it again. The gospel begins, here's your part, with love. We'll work on that. So Paul in 2 Corinthians says, uh, Christ's love, I mean, it just, it compels me. The same chapter where he talks about how we're new in Christ, everything is made new, is also the same chapter where he says, and this is why I needed to tell you. This is why I can't shut up. This is why we all need to share the good news, to share the gospel. It's because the love of Christ compels us. You can write this down. We are compelled by love. If you're sharing the gospel does not start with this, it'll turn into a sales job. It'll turn into you trying to get um, notches on your evangelism belt, you know, just trying to bring people to Christ. And, but the Bible, for the Bible and for God, for Jesus, for Paul, for all the disciples, it starts with love. Let me show you another example of Paul's writings. This is to the people who are living in the city of Corinth. Now let me show you the people living in Thessalonica. He says, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, right? So see the word gospel here and share, all my little scribbles here. It's because we loved you, we were compelled by love that we were delighted to share the gospel, but not only the gospel, also our very lives as well. This phrase, our lives as well, helps us see how being compelled by love turns into sharing the gospel. Being compelled by love turns into sharing the gospel. And this is the, the heart, and I do mean it that way, the heart and soul of our method here at Open Door called the five Bs. There's the heart. And so the whole idea here is that a person who's becoming like Christ, that's a Christian, they got the love of Christ in their heart, and they're in the love of Christ, they're in Christ, that, that love, that could be just celebrating the love of God. It could be the church, which is where the, the people who love God gather. But this whole idea of our strategy, which we see in the New Testament, especially in the life of Jesus, is that he, he will intentionally reach out. So for you, it's you leave the church. Yes, I did ask you, I did tell you, leave the church. And you go outside into the wild blue yonder or the wild gray yonder, outside into the world. You don't evangelize just in the church. You mostly evangelize outside. You, and this happens just like Jesus did with his disciples. He started building relationships with them. Before they were disciples, he's building relationships. The goal is for them to become disciples, followers of Jesus. 
But it starts with building relationships. So a person who knows Christ has the love of God in their heart, and they're sharing with a person who does not yet have the love of Christ in their heart. They're, they have another heart, you know, but, but as you're building that relationship, then you're, you're, you're praying for that person. You're loving on them. You're hanging out with them. You're, you're just pouring into that person, listening to them, and praying that because you love them so much, the day will come when they'll see who Jesus is and that they'll believe. And so at any point along this strategy, you're, you're hopeful that this person will believe on the, that's another B, they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if they don't soon, then bring them to a church or our church or a life group or some place where they can get around other Christians and hear people talk about the gospel and, and hear people talk about salvation and following Jesus and, and experience other people. So it's not just you, but it's others. And then and then if they still haven't believed, then you surround them with belonging. And if they do believe, you surround them with belonging. This, these are the bees here. You build, you bring, you help them belong. This is where all of us as the church help anybody who walks into our doors belong. It doesn't matter whether they believe or not. I, we want them to feel the belonging love of God. So whether you meet somebody in the neighborhood or whether you invite someone over for a barbecue or whether you invite them over to church, when they get around you all, other Christians, we should surround them with the love of God so they feel like they belong. Again, the whole goal all along has been to help them believe. That believing could happen here, could happen here, 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 here. Whatever it is, when the Holy Spirit opens their eyes so that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, surrender their life to him. Now watch this. Their next step, actually their, their, their step of belief automatically becomes their step of their very first step of becoming like Christ. Now watch this. As a brand new Christian, now they're in the very early stages of, beco of becoming, the beginning in Christ stage, and they're supposed to go build relationships and help people you know, and bring people and help people belong so that they will believe. And this, this just keeps on going. It's never ending. When I devise this strategy, which I just basically saw in the life of Jesus, you know, 18, 19 years ago, I designed it in such a way that it's never ending. There, there's never an end. You don't get to an end. That's heaven. <laughs> but on this earth, there's never ending. We just keep building and bringing and keep, it just, it just gets recycling because there's more and more people that need to hear the good news of Christ. Amen? So, so this is the process we saw Jesus building relationship with Peter, James, and John, and then bringing them along as he preached the gospel and as he healed people, and they just they kind of followed along and listened to Jesus, and then he helped them belong, surrounded them with his love. Pharisees got upset. They don't believe. They shouldn't belong. Jesus goes, you belong before you believe in my kingdom. Then the day came when each one of the disciples believed. They put their faith in Christ. They, I, I believe in who you are. And they started to become like Christ. And now they go out and make disciples. They go out and build relationships. They go out and lead people, share the good news. So I, I just ripped through that to help you, because some of you know it, others of you have seen it on the wall, others of you have heard us talk about it, but you're not sure how does that all fit together. Well, this is the, the whole idea of being compelled by love to share with people the gospel. And some of you are thinking, well, I, I know the gospel, but I haven't yet figured out how to share it. So I need to learn how to share. And again, let me show you our excursion guide, because on page uh, 133, which basically is appendix, not basically, is appendix C in your excursion guide, we, there's a, lo a long version of the five Bs. There's, it's explained so you see how each one of these stages work in each one of these steps so you can identify what your next step in is as you are building relationships with people who don't know Jesus. And actually, I love talking about this in these younger, these earlier stages because when you first become a Christian, you know, you know a lot more non-Christians than you probably ever will because the more you follow Jesus, the more you, you hang out with followers of Jesus and it usually turns into you, you, the less you hang out with people who are not followers of Jesus and sometimes you get to the point where for some Christians, they don't even know somebody who's not a Christian, which is a tragedy. They don't even know somebody who's not a Christian. So we want to help you catch that next step to share while you still 
you know, are, are young in, in the Lord and enough to know other people. So how, how exactly do I do that? Well, in your excursion guide on page 81, there's a little QR code that will lead you to a video. It's just a short minute, 55-second video that I want to show you now. It's been on our website for years. Um, it's in our excursion guide. Some of you have not yet seen it, but this just gives a phenomenal, I found this some time ago, a phenomenal, really quick sketch of, of how you might share with someone when they come to the point where they say, I, I, I want to believe in Jesus. And watch this video with me. Have you ever wondered what the big deal is with Jesus? Why everybody talks about him all the time? Why folks think you should know him? Here's why Jesus should matter to all of us. God created us to have a relationship with him, but this thing called sin separates us from God. The Bible says it this way, all of us have sinned and all of us fall short of the glory that God intended for us. Imagine you're on a cliff and over on the other side of this canyon is God. Now too many people think the way that we can bridge that canyon is with our own efforts, going to church, reading the Bible, being philanthropic, loving your neighbor, being moral. And while all these things are good, None of them are good enough to bridge the gap that separates us from God. You see, this isn't just a little chasm. Don't think the Grand Canyon. Think wider than that. It's wider than anybody can imagine. So I don't care what kind of athlete you are. You can take whatever kind of running start you want, and you're always going to fall short. The wages of sin is death. So how do you bridge the gap? The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And the Bible tells us we receive that gift by faith. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's with your heart that a person believes and it results in righteousness, and it's with the mouth you confess, resulting in salvation. This is why Jesus is such a big deal. His death made provision for your sins. His death covered your sins. His death bridged the gap. There is no other way to God except through him. Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, and Jesus is the life. So what do you do? You pray this. Father, forgive me for I'm a sinner. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his cross. Father, I trust in him. And I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe you raised him from the dead, declaring with power that he's the son of God. Jesus bridges the gap of my sin, and it's the gift of his life for me that sets me free. Now you know why Jesus is such a big deal. <laughs> believe it and share it. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that great? I, I love that. So again, it's on our website. It's in our, uh, our QR code for our excursion guide. Um, check that out. Uh, look at it. Watch it again and again. It's just so concise and so powerful and so true and might help you as a part of equipping you because that's what we want to do is equip you to help you share the gospel so that when you have that opportunity, in fact, let me, let me tell you a quick story. Um, I'm in my 20s, and I'm working on the, the, the port of Boston in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm newly married and uh, still have a glow from that, that, you know, all that. And I'm working with all these rough longshoremen in Boston. They're called Southies. And uh, most of them drink their lunch. That is, they go to the bar every lunch and just drink themselves and, into oblivion, come back and stumble around the ports. And it's just, they're, they're, they're rough guys, swearing all over the place. And here I am, this brand new Christian. I'm not a brand new Christian, brand new husband, and but a, a lover of Jesus as well. And this guy named Ernie, and I love to talk about Ernie because Ernie looks exactly like Bert of Bert and Ernie. We still remember him, right? I mean, it, 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 just right now, his image just came in your face. That's my friend Ernie, like Bert. And um, he's like, you know, you're different. Now, what, what's up with you? And now, you know, a lot of people don't drink and don't swear and don't live rough lives. That doesn't make them Christians. And so he didn't know anything about my life. He was like, you know, you're all right, man. What's up with you? And I'm like, well, whatever. You know, I'm still a shy guy. So one day um, I need a ride home because we only had one car in those days. And so um, Ernie, I said, hey, can, you, can I give a ride? Can you give me a ride? So he, he gives me a ride and we stop in front of our apartment complex and out of the blue, Ernie starts pouring out his heart. What a mess his life was. And God, I, I just have made a mess in my life. I don't know what to do. My back's against the wall. I, I don't even know why I'm telling you this. Uh, he doesn't know I'm a Christian. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but you just seem like a, a guy who might listen. And I did. And that's all I did. 
he, he lobs me a softball, you know. My life is such a mess. I would do anything I could do to change it. I wish, I wish my life was more like yours. And I stood there, or actually sat there in his car and went, uh, uh, like, well, you know, uh, I got to go, Ernie. And I got out of the car, and I walked away from a guy who was eager to hear the gospel, even if he didn't understand that I was about to, I could have shared the gospel. And as soon as I shut the door, I thought, I need to go back. And, but I was like, no, and I chickened out, and I just almost like, increased my pace and went into the apartment complex. And I'm like, you idiot. But I didn't know what to say. I just was like, ah! Okay, now fast forward, almost, only a year later, and um, I had made friends with this guy named Robert, who we're about both basketball players. He was a great basketball player, sweet jump shot. Um, and one, after a game one time, we're sitting around talking about life, and he does the same thing Ernie does. He pours his heart out. I think my wife's about to leave me. This guy's a Marine, um, uh, serving our country, but his life is a mess. And, uh, and he does the same thing Ernie does. He's like, I would do anything to get my, change my life. And this time... I began to tell him about Jesus, and I began to share with him how Christ had changed my life. And I, I said to him, you know, Robert, would, you know, would you like to give your life to Christ? And he said, he's, he's a black guy with just the whitest teeth, and his face just lit up. He's like, yes! And so I led him to Christ right there, and I thought his face would, couldn't get any brighter. It did, and he's just like, you know, he, he looked, looked a little bit like Magic Johnson. Have you ever seen Magic Johnson, a basketball player? This big smile. This is Robert. And um, Robert got his life transformed, and his life changed. Now, what happened between Ernie and Robert? Uh, somebody taught me how to share my faith. And I learned, you know, the bridge illustration that we just showed you up there. I, I, I learned how to tell someone about Jesus. That's how simple. And when I talk like that and invite, invite you to that, I know some of you are like, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm afraid. I, I understand that. You're not the first person that's been afraid. I don't know what to say. You know, um, I'm afraid they might reject me. I'm afraid I might say the wrong thing. Everybody, well, almost everybody experiences these kinds of fears. You got to push through that fear and the Holy Spirit will help you. And again, this is not a new thing. Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy 2,000 years ago, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's not given us a spirit of fear and, and timidity. He's given us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And a lot of people end right there at verse 7. But there's another verse. The very next word is the word, so. Have you ever noticed this verse before? So don't be ashamed to tell others about. See, this verse here is an evangelism verse. It's not a verse about pushing through some other kind of issue. It's about don't be ashamed to tell others because that's what we are because we're afraid. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You're ashamed of the gospel if you don't push through your fear to share. I can say that because I used to be that way. And sometimes I still am. I get my old timidity comes up in my introversion, and I'm like, I, 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 I don't know what to say. And I just, Holy Spirit, I breathe in. Give me the words. Fill me with your love. And I, I begin to share. So you, you push through that fear. And then a part of learning to share the gospel is beginning to navigate the obstacles that come up. And we call this in theology apologetics. It's being able to, to give a defense for what you believe in. Here's just some of the more popular ones. I could... You know, here's six. Guys, there's 600 of these objections, obstacles. So I, I would love to believe that, but I can't because why would I believe in a God who allows people to suffer? And that becomes a hurdle, becomes a, a not a hurdle, becomes a block that they can't get through. Do you know what to say to a person who is thinking about coming to Christ, but they can't get over one of these obstacles? Uh, Apostle Peter wrote, always be prepared. That's what this is, learning to share the gospel. I'm getting prepared to give, and here's the Greek word apologia, an answer, a defense, an answer to those questions that I just put up so that everyone who asks you are able to give a reason for the hope that you have. That's getting equipped. That's learning. And the people that equip us typically 
are those who have moved into this fourth stage. But it's, I say typically because I'm not yet in this stage. I'm in stage four in a lot of the core Christ-like characteristics, but I, honestly, I am not in this stage yet. Actually, I only know two people, and maybe more, maybe one of you are, or two of you are, but I only know two people who lived in this stage, who were equipping people like you and me to Forget the word evangelist for a second. Just think, equipping us to tell about Jesus. And these guys or women, they model a life of evangelism, of telling others. They model that, and they train others to do this. One of these men is a man who used to be one of the pastors of this church. His name is Daryl Farney. Some of you know Daryl. I've never met anyone other than this guy I'm about to tell you about named Chick who modeled and trained others so well. He was living in this final stage of reproducing in Christ in this area of intentional evangelism. And he equipped and has equipped thousands of people, Christians, to share their faith. And this other guy I just mentioned briefly, his name is Charles, but all his friends called him Chick. Chick Shaver. <laughs> He's the guy that taught me how to share my faith. He's the guy that came into my life between Ernie and Robert. Because I never met Chick and never taken a class from him, I didn't know how to share my faith. But once I met Chick, now I could do it. And Robert is a Christian today because I got equipped, because I got trained. And that's helped me grow out of these stages. And I'm still, just be honest, I'm just not here yet. But that's, that's my goal. So I want to leave you with the simple question, what's your next step, right? As, as you, pro, pro, you know, progress through these, what's your next step in growing to be more like Christ? And the excursion guide is loaded with equipping to help you share the gospel, to give you tools. Uh, in the next step survey, there's all kinds of resources that we're doing everything we can as a church to give you the tools, but you got to Use them. You got to take them. You got to learn them. You got to put them into practice. And I tell you what, Robert Patrick will forever be grateful because I took a class or because I got trained and shared the gospel with him. And I don't know whatever happened to Ernie. I moved very soon after that to a different city completely lost touch with him. God brought Ernie into my life. I did not share the gospel with him. God brought Robert into my life. I was able to share the good news and he will live forever with Jesus. God's bringing people into your life and to mine. Let's all take our next step, amen? Let's all take our next step in getting equipped and growing through the stages to become more and more like Jesus. Let me, let me pray. Lord, send us, those of us listening today, send us, equip us, fill us with your love so that when you bring an Ernie into our life, we'll know what to say. And when you bring a Robert into our life, We'll know what to say. And Lord, I pray you'll stir each one of our hearts today that you would fill us with your love to the point where we're compelled to take that next step. Maybe none of us in this room will become evangelists like Chick and, and Daryl, but we can all grow. So Lord, may you find in each one of us a willingness to take our next step Maybe that starts with taking the next step survey. We've never, we've never taken that. Maybe that's, that starts with going back to that survey and saying, okay, where are the resources? What, what are the steps that I can take? God, I pray for each person hearing my voice. We will take our next step in this core Christ-like characteristic of growing our ability to tell others about Jesus. And I pray
pray this in your name, Lord.